Absolutely. Uh, and then live transcript, enable, um, <laughs> and then, well, I mean, something to make it easier, right? Uh, and then have that going. I have three different sites that are recording just because I'm like, please don't let me lose this data. You are uh, making sure it gets recorded. That's good. I like that. <laughs> Double right. sure. Triple sure. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Um, so there is a bit of a script that is followed for the course of this um, interview. So if some of it sounds yeah, very scripted, it's because of that. Um, so just getting started, so thank you so much for joining me today and doing this one-on-one -on -one interview. As you know, the aim of this interview is to hear more about your experiences within the domains of equity, diversity, and inclusivity. Your participation in this interview is, as you know, completely voluntary, and if at any point you would like to step out, take a break, pause, or end early, you are welcome to do so. Just let me know. Um, these interviews, as you have heard, are recorded for transcripts to be generated, but they will be anonymized, so no names will be carried forward. So feel free, um, to, if, even if you mention something, it won't move forward. Um, now, all that being said, do I have your consent to start? Absolutely. Thank you. Now, before we get started, do you have any questions for me? Um, no. So this is like, um, no, no, I don't know. Uh, so the whole is this like a qualitative study like you got, you're trying to find themes and stuff or exactly yeah okay perfect perfect okay now Great. for um data gathering purposes can you state for the record your age your gender and your role at the cancer center yeah so i'm 38 um i identify as female she her i guess if we're using those words i've never used those words before but that's great. Um, and then uh, my role at the Cancer Center is a medical oncologist uh, at Children's Cancer Center. Beautiful. Um, so the first question starts off with me asking you to define or explain three terms for me. Um, so to whatever ability uh, you can, can you please define the term equity? Okay. <laughs> um, I think... Uh, I don't know, I can describe it in a way that like, that everybody has equal footing and equal opportunities. And if somebody is coming from diverse backgrounds that may disadvantage them, mm -hmm. that there are systemic tools in place in order to help make, um, in order to help support that person. Mm -hmm. And I'm really just thinking of that, I don't know if you've probably seen that meme, but like, do you know when, like it's that they're trying to look over a fence and then there's that, one person that who's like taller. Picture, trying to yeah. watch the baseball game. Exactly. Yeah. And then there's like that, that, you know, the shorter person gets, or like whoever can't see over that, over the obstacle mm. gets help. And that's where, what I would envision equity to be about. So it could be due to any different obstacles or barriers, et cetera, mm. but that there should be a systemic recognition and um and then also mechanisms in play to help make sure that everybody's on equal footing for whatever their goals may be for sure um and so the second term that i'll get you to define or explain is diversity um so diversity i'd say is probably uh yeah it's a good question <laughs> diversity is just i i would i think the definition I think of is really having different voices present on all levels of systems and not just say um, hiring at lower levels or um, or to be written down on a piece of paper but also having those different voices at all levels in order to identify say the systemic barriers so um, diversity can be based on any different factors but um, just having diverse voices and that they're able to be heard and incorporated into a system. And so I think you'll you'll likely tie this to the next term as well. So how would you mm -hmm. define or explain inclusivity or inclusion? And um, so having those voices, so everybody's voices um, heard and that opportunities are given um, equally and um, and that no one is ex <laughs> no one is excluded I'm not really de defining I'm just saying words but um, nobody's ex excluded because of 
um, um, systemic uh, barriers. Mm -hmm. So really what I'm hearing is that that kind of theme of welcoming differences and making space for differences. Yeah, and really, um, like, um, really understanding the differences and how that affects that individual or a group of individuals, let's even say that, mm -hmm. um, and how, how they are navigating through a system. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. So the second question then, keeping those ideas and themes in mind, do you see these domains influencing the patient clinician relationship or those interactions? And if so, in what ways? Um, I think I can, like, I think beginning with equity, I, I think we definitely see that, especially when we're talking about uh, socioeconomic equity and then access to say care or um, tests, let's say, mm -hmm. um, that's definitely apparent and then also um, plays a part sometimes uh, or does play a part in our relationship with our patients as well. Um, whether there is that inherent bias sometimes when we do see a patient versus um, what we're able to offer them and then the in the, like um, the inequity in their care as well mm -hmm. and related to their socioeconomic status and um, differences mm -hmm. I think also you know race uh, racial inclusivity or like equity or um, diversity as well mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes there are definitely I can say for myself I can make assumptions as well and there is a, there can be this implicit bias that I can recognize sometimes mm -hmm. and um, and it's correcting myself and recognizing that and then also from the patient standpoint as well there can be this bias um, being a younger uh, <laughs> uh, female physician of color there can be some biases there and uh, i've seen that in definitely in some interactions with patients as well mm -hmm. um, given you know what they ask for what um the way they interact with you versus someone else um, mm -hmm. i think that also plays a part can you so you brought up a couple of things that i'd like to explore a little bit further so you mentioned that there can be bias on the part of providers going into you know an encounter um mm -hmm. what sorts of biases implicitly or explicitly do you find yourself falling into sometimes sometimes it can be um Sometimes it can be um, from, you know, from patients who um, initially can present um, with, uh, I'm say, yeah, I'm trying to think about, like, sometimes it can be from different patients from different demographics, so, and how they're interacting, like, the first interactions themselves, mm -hmm. and then I can find myself being biased that, oh, they just don't want to get treatment. And then and then I stop and reflect a little bit more, like want to learn a bit more about, well, no, it's not that they don't want treatment. It's that, they're, that, that there's other things that are going on with mental health or the lack of social supports. Um, and it can be even as, as um, also not as simple, but also it can just be that there's a financial concern there. Mm -hmm. And I may not have thought of that right away made the conclusion that they just don't want to take the care, mm -hmm. uh, don't want to do, uh, don't want to follow the instructions that I've provided. And uh, it can depend on the day and how tired mm -hmm. I am <laughs> or how, mm -hmm. how the day has been going. But, um, but with a little bit more conversation and getting to know the patient a bit more and trying to understand where they're coming from, I think it's, um, it's that's where those biases or those assumptions that can be made on uh, regarding a patient um, can be distilled a bit further and, and then trust can be established and then um, we can work together with those patients. So, mm -hmm. and I think it can be sometimes um, patients from different backgrounds. So whether it be, you know, from both spectrums of socioeconomic status, so whether they're very uh, on the lower, uh, lower socioeconomic status, um, 
scale versus higher socioeconomic status scale. Like, I, I think it falls in both those extremes mm -hmm. and then just understanding where they're coming from. And then I know that you mentioned the converse side of it, like the other side of the coin, where patients may make presumptions or biases against or for you as a provider mm -hmm. based on what they see. Have you seen that, like, come to the front in terms of being able to actually navigate that relationship? Yeah, I think about, when, when I was speaking about that, the one patient encounter that I thought of was, like, you know what? Middle-aged man, very gruff, very uh, bit, uh, like tall, and you know, just a presence. And then um, the, his interactions with me versus a male resident were very, very different. Like he would be very like, "No, I'm not doing that." And, do you do you know what you're talking about? And like question the recommendations that I would be making mm -hmm. versus with um, say uh, say if I had a learner that went in prior prior to me and it was a male mm -hmm. um the interactions would have gone a bit more smoother and he really only uh, going in afterwards with the resident um he would only really speak to the resident himself um, uh -huh. so uh which was you know challenging especially because it was young in my uh, it was early on in my career as staff mm -hmm. um and I had never really encountered a patient like that but uh mm -hmm. yeah so that was I guess against, um, but with time as well, I think it was just establishing trust and then, um, maybe listening, maybe listening to his, uh, to his, uh, worries or like, and then explaining some of his concern, like listening to his concerns as well. And then establishing trust through just good practice and mm -hmm. trying to ignore all the other stuff, other stuff, yeah. I guess. But that's challenging for sure, right? Like knowing yeah. that there is a, an inherent antagonism or distrust going into a room. Absolutely, and I and I I I want like I I think there could have been a lot of different layers to that interaction. Like obviously that people are scared versus don't want to be there, and then and then of course the the other parts of like what you're bringing. To that interaction as well like young female of color yeah. maybe they just can't relate to that so mm -hmm. um yeah so that and that sort of has been happening as well as i've taken over a practice for another retired um oncologist who mm -hmm. you know was is older is like um is well known in the field you know is a male is white and um uh, i don't know whether it is because i'm so maybe visually different to him mm -hmm. <laughs> um, some patients um, and uh, some patients do feel um, that they are not 100% comfortable with me and they've told me like oh this is new for me and I really it's a new team and I don't feel totally comfortable about this which I think may have happened anyways no mm -hmm. matter who the provider is but whether those other things also play a factor mm -hmm. so I know that it you know oftentimes it's the more, I think, tense or negative interactions that stay with us. On the converse mm -hmm. side, do you have any anecdotes that come to mind where, um, you know, your connection to another patient was actually enhanced because of your ability to bridge those various domains? Or oh. vice versa, like where they felt that they connected with you, um, you know, more closely because they recognize those inherent differences in you. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah, I'd say probably, I think I can think of uh, several interactions where um, I felt it, uh, several interactions, largely with younger patients, where um, perhaps I could relate a bit more to what their unique challenges are. And I'm specifically talking about like young women with breast cancer, that was largely um, my experiences. And um, so talking about, say, fertility preservation or if they already had young kids, or talking a little bit about how things are going at home and like, how are the kids doing? And, and then relating to that, you know, specific stage in life. And say one, one particular um, patient I met while she was pregnant in her third trimester and you know there were some uh, some uh, appointments where we actually just talked about 
and I just said, like, how are things going? She was very, very anxious, uh, a lot of health-related anxiety, and um, and that really um, clouded some of, or like influenced our interactions and what she, what she felt was going on and her worries about recurrence. Mm-hmm. And by approaching, say that, and then the other stressors in her life, including a young child and a newborn at home, and talking about that stage, and like that these challenges are normal. I think that helped with our whole interaction and, and relationship moving forward and establishing trust and, the, and mm-hmm. the relatability as well. Mm-hmm. And then also I've had, a, you know, there's been several South Asian women, you know, so I don't, you know, like my background is South Asian. So um, a lot of um, middle-aged South Asian women as well who have been diagnosed with breast cancer and then um, understanding um, where they're coming from and the cultural um nuances as well I think has been helpful in encouraging say patients with their recovery and um, establishing that self-care is very important not always practiced and not at the forefront of like South Asian culture especially for women Mm -hmm. just giving them that permission for self-care and understanding where they're coming from I think has helped as well for sure so really yeah. like deep diving and establishing those connections and humanizing mm-hmm. the person on the other side. Yeah, and then I think most recently as well, like um another young woman who's uh, her family's like she's from China herself and her family's in China and her dad just died and she wasn't able to go back to China to be with him and she was just so de- obviously so understandably yeah. devastated by that and you know, um living being a first generation Canadian, having um, family in India and other places, and not being able to be there uh, during the death and such, uh, and being there for the grieving process. I think mm-hmm. that was, we just spent the whole uh, afternoon or that appointment talking about that and seeing how, you know, unfortunately it's common and normal the way she was feeling and just reaching yeah. out to on that. So, yeah. For sure. So oh, I mean, it's funny, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> <laughs> That's not dad, the oh, intent. Yeah. That's not the intent. Although no, emotions no, are no, valid, no, and if you experience no, them, no, continue yeah. to experience them. Um, no. <laughs> so, have, have you ever been there, either as a staff or a learner, where you've witnessed an encounter where someone else, like another care provider, had to incorporate, you know, some of the domains or all of the domains of EDI in their interactions with a patient? And in reflection of whatever this anecdote is, was it done well or was it done poorly? What stood out? Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, I can't, well, I'm going to tell you the truth. I can't really recall for residency <laughs> too much. Um, um, yeah, I think, no, as a resident, I think definitely there um just seeing whether it was explicitly um, the three domains that we're talking about, whether it was done on purpose about that or whether it was just being empathetic and understanding to a, another individual that you may not entirely relate to in their experience and such, but um, just that empathy and compassion and then listening to them and understand, asking the questions, what's important to you was, I, I think, a huge, maybe a, a, a great question that helps incorporate and understand where our patient is coming from, from mm-hmm. and to help them feel included and not make assumptions about what they want and what's important to them. Based solely on like where they live, it's what mm-hmm. they look like, and where they're coming from. So um, I think I saw that quite a bit with uh, with my uh, preceptors in fellowship and. And so I think that was well done and continues to be, um, I think that's what I've learned uh, learned uh, over the years, is just asking a question and not making assumptions about patients and what's important to them and what the life that they're living and what are their challenges. Um, and I think if we're even going a little bit deeper, that like that serious illness conversation that we've all been trying to do also, I think, whether it intended to or has done it by default, by asking those questions about what's important to them at the end of life, or um, it also helps to ensure that uh, diversity, inclusion, and 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So really, you know, what I'm hearing is opening that space for people to speak on their own behalf as opposed to, you know, making assumptions about what they would want. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Now, on the flip side, are there any anecdotes that stand out where you remember someone really not doing it well? Um, I'd say yes. Uh, usually, I think more as a trainee. Um, I think sometimes, you know, staff would come in and and certain staff would come in and, and make the conclusions like you're doing fine and then they leave and then that person's just sort of left you're sort of the last person to leave the room and that person's just left there and wondering what just happened and um not feeling heard mm-hmm. um um you know I can't remember whether this was like specific to say vulnerable populations or did I actually look into the, you know, who this vulnerable population was um, even for myself I could say you know I'm, uh, there were a couple of times, I, I can think of one patient or, um, in particular recently where <clears throat> I may not have asked the question about how are you doing? How are things going? Um, or like asked about those other social determinants of health, like cost of living and financial <laughs> burdens and things like that until the patient, um, you know, brought it up and then and then a lot of her other symptoms or or, our other interactions together made a bit more sense about why um say she was very stressed or uneasy or unhappy with the way things were going so um Mm -hmm. i'd say maybe i haven't done it well in lots of different uh, and some instances as well and that's um taught me to always ask always you know review big picture things in order to understand more about my patients and help them feel heard. And so what factors do you think often influence, say, those interactions where staff are maybe not hearing their patients or are sort of leaving them feeling like they've been swept through and and not really gotten to the core of their interactions? What are some of the things that influence that? Do you think it's, you know, unconscious, like, issues is it like systemic issues or is it because people don't want to try or spend the time what what do you think it is yeah I I I don't think it's that they don't want to try or spend the time but I I do feel like it is a time constraint like I feel like there's this pressure like build like everybody's I feel like every staff member feels like I don't have enough time for patients and um and addressing those uh, other, you know, non-physical things that um, um, when we're thinking about someone who's on treatment, you're really thinking safety of treatment. Can mm-hmm. we go forward? Can we go, you know, um, and <clears throat> addressing the other parts of their life and whether they're feeling heard and whether um, there are those other influence, like other parts of their lives that are influencing how treatment is going. Um, I think is maybe not on our, our radar or part of our training even mm-hmm. to ask about those things. Um, and then uh, the other part is that I think it's just time to tell you the truth. And I think yeah. everybody would love to have that 360 approach and really think about uh, what's going on in uh, a patient's life and try to help them as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Um and then other parts, you know, other other part of this, and I was just discussing this with another physician, is that there's a real sense of burnout where, like, um, hearing about um, taking that time and, um, you know, counseling or even being that sounding board for patients um, um, to hear about their challenges and, and, and what they're going through, I think that sort of... Uh, uh, capacity maybe you know like our cup is full our glass is full and adding more on is is challenging so that sort of empathy may be low at times mm-hmm. um, because of burnout to tell you the truth so yeah, for yeah. Sure. um so transitioning slightly from that point to the next question which is you know thinking back to you know you clearly have mentioned a lot of times where 
bridging that gap or reaching out and asking those questions was really important to your clinical encounters. In reflection, have you ever received any formal or informal training in EDI as it relates to your role presently in oncology? And if not there at any point in your training? No, I can't say I have. I don't know. Shivani, have you? Like maybe you can tell me if you have. So we we've done the same training program. And it like <laughs> jog my memory about whether. Uh, no, I can't say I have had any specific training. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I'd have to say when I was training, uh, you know, EDI wasn't uh, as uh, it wasn't um, in the forefront or in the focus. Um, it's only been recently. I can only say, um, you know, there are some webinars and things like that on uh, different educational um, groups that I'm part of that um, trying to uh, do those webinars on my own time <laughs> is where I've been trying to bone up mm-hmm. um, on, on this topic. So I would love to just be better trained on this <laughs> so I don't feel like I'm making like, so I feel like I'm helping patients and, and doing the right thing and not disenfranchising anybody or silencing mm-hmm. anybody. Um, you know, most recently, Camo, I think, did an, uh, a great talk on EDI and uh, vulnerable mm-hmm. patients, um, which was really helpful. And um, so I'd say that was really the one talk I've been to of late. So but, uh, I think it is, I think you've identified probably that there is a deficiency in training. Like we all say EDI, EDI, but it's a big topic and like how to approach it and how do you incorporate it in your practice is, um, it hasn't been translated or moved forward or I haven't figured it out yet <laughs> where the training is. So you mentioned that you've sought out these opportunities yourself, you know, going to a conference, attending a seminar, listening to talks. Were you told that you needed to do this or this was self-driven? Uh, self-driven. Uh, um, and when I say, uh, you know, I sought out webinars, it was like signed up and then didn't have the time to do it. <laughs> or like it was at like clinic time or yeah. it was in the evening and it was totally not going to happen so um because of time constraints so uh, I can't say I have um so I haven't um been told um uh, correction there was one you know the women's symposium um Mm -hmm. at McMaster um there was you know I think Bindi had our our, you know our department uh, education department head um did say that this was a uh, this would be an important thing to go to and I think she also gave all, you know, gave the residents an opportunity to go as well on the time off. Um, <clears throat> I happened to attend it because I wasn't in clinic. And, then, you know, that's a, but that's essentially it. Yeah. And so when knowing that these are things that you seek out, like what what motivates you to even want to attend, like the desire to want to attend? Where does that come from? I think like. So, I, because the desire comes from being a person who, um, you know, is in the minority and her, you know, her, my own viewpoints or, um, or own experiences, I've experienced where people have made assumptions about me and um assumed um that I want x y and z or don't want x y and z and mainly on a professional level um and so and knowing that I come from a background where you know I, I've been very privileged um knowing that again women let's say women because I largely um my patient population is women women can not a lot of times their health concerns are not heard and that um that people are so diverse and have such diverse needs and need to be included in, in this, um, in the system. And then they need to, the system is, is disenfranchising and not helping so many people because it wasn't designed to. So I think that's where being part of the system, um, that's where the desire is to help make a change little by little, I guess. Yeah. Has, has that process of wanting to, 
you know, learn and wanting to grow ever been uncomfortable or um, ever been something that you shied away from because it was, you know, uncomfortable or unpleasant or hard? No, I think I can, you know, it's not great to always think, like, sometimes it's uh, when you are thinking of patient interactions and you felt, oh, like, I could, that could have gone better. And then reflecting on your own um, role in that patient interaction, that can be difficult and like how to correct it and how to make sure that you learn from those interactions um, can be difficult. But I think uh through medical training, I think that re- self-reflection is uh, is always ingrained in us, and especially at Mac, there's a lot of self self reflection. So I don't think that's uh, uh, I don't think I shy away from that. Um, but again, having the time to build and improve is is challenging. Yeah. Do you think that there's any barriers that other people might face um, trying to similarly seek out those opportunities to learn and grow, whether um, external to themselves or internal to themselves, when you think about, you know, the department or the division that you work in? Um, yeah, I, yes, I do. Uh, I think barriers time again. I think, um, I think when we are pressured or stressed, I think we all just fall back to the basics of medicine and, 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 and to date our base, our, the basics of medicine in our training has been safety Mm -hmm. and then moving up. And that's it. And, and I think the other thing is support as well. So like, should it like these, a lot of these, um, barriers, systemic barriers are things that A, we weren't trained fully trained to understand and they've evolved as well since our say basic training but that there are other allied health professionals that are trained in this but they're also there's also a deficient like there's a lack of them and then there's not a a lot of support as well so I think it's again a systems issue but um I think time being the first and then and then not having a lot of support to help support practitioner who is they worried about it worried about these three principles mm-hmm. especially in their patients that may be you know um dis- uh, vulnerable mm-hmm. um and then there's not uh, not a lot of support although there's a lot of now recognition about the, the issue which is great mm-hmm. but i think it's just pushing that a bit forward to now what do we do and how do we make sure that everybody is uh, recognizing these three principles and incorporating it into their practice so for sure yeah so i mean the recognition is getting there but yeah for the most part (laughs) yeah but the constraints within the system would prohibit even those who want to try want to learn want to grow from doing so yeah yeah Mm -hmm. and i think I think everybody's aware and like, how could you not be after the pandemic, which highlighted, you know, equity and mm-hmm. inclusion and, and let's say even diver- like diversity as well, like highlighted all these three principles right in your face every day. And like, how could you not um, think that this is not an issue, but um, mm-hmm. yeah. So it's certainly not an issue of passivity. Like people aren't passive about it. Um, it's just that there's not time to to really address it or it's it it's such a like you think of like equity it's such a um a big topic it's almost like climate change you know it's there but how do you actually make a difference or how do you how do you actually feel like you're helping and I think maybe that's the same thing with equity especially say if you're in the majority or Mm -hmm. you're in that you know I want to say the majority but like that (laughs) that uh that person who has not experienced any of like ex- exclusion or assumptions or mm-hmm. um, inequity in any sort of way, mm-hmm. then they don't have that personal experience to build on. Mm-hmm. And then it's, they don't like, they feel the problem is so big. How do I actually make a dent? I mm-hmm. have no training. And then I also have no time to figure it out. So it's like, you know, and I have a very little support. So yeah. 
So if the problem is so big, how can any one individual make a difference? Yeah, and, and I think, like, people are trying and people are, you know, like, I, I, you know, when you see, let's just even basic basic thing for, like, say, gender equity, mm-hmm. you do see, you know, division heads and, and, um, and say, male as on mm-hmm. on these talks at these women's symposiums that's that's huge that 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 they're trying and wanting to understand the problem mm-hmm. the problem that is present and what their their department like half probably half or more of their department is experiencing and the unique challenges that they may have mm-hmm. but <clears throat> I can't say everybody has has a time or has taken those steps so mm-hmm. right so when you think about your own comfort within these domains. You know, would you say that this is something that you're very uncomfortable with, comfortable with? And, you know, in reflection, are there particular skill sets um, that you want to continue to work on um, or specific skill sets that you're like, oh, this is an area of weakness for me? Yeah, um, I'd say probably um, areas of weakness for me is. uh, um probably the, uh, the socioeconomic inequities um, uh, that our parent, patients experience and um, <clears throat> and understanding, you know, financial resources and and help that's provided. And then also understanding where a patient is coming from, where, I'm, where I could say like, well, just go on OW. And then the patient's like, no, I cannot do that. That is not something I ever want to do. And then having, understanding where they're coming from and then but also knowing that, like, uh, so understanding where they're coming from and what that what that means is mm-hmm. for them. Um, as an example, mm-hmm. um, what do you do well? Others, huh? What do you do well? What are you proud that you? Oh, do well? <laughs> I think I can be. Huh, I think I can be empathetic. I think mm-hmm. I can open spaces for my patients to feel comfortable to talk about these things, um, and that's establishing trust and talking with them and giving them the time that they need. Mm-hmm. Um, and it may not be initially about all the other things that like all these other, like other factors It may initially still first be about how they're feeling based on their diagnosis. But I think with time, I've seen that patients do um, feel, start to feel more comfortable and then open up about these other challenges that they're, that, that are ongoing. Yeah. Mm-hmm, for sure. Um, you have mentioned cases where your interactions with a patient um, from their side may have been presumptive of you because of who they saw. Have you had any encounters um, personally as a professional, say, within your division or department, where you were affected because another person did not understand or choose to understand your identities or your lived experience? Yes. <laughs> um, like, uh, I think the assumptions that some, certain people can make about what you want for your career um, versus your personal life and assumptions can be made about, especially if you're a mother or a young mother or say want to start a family, don't want to start a family uh, or want. So I think I've had those assumptions. Um, various assumptions thrown at me throughout my, you know, fellowship career, et cetera. And oftentimes it can be a passing remark and that's it, or assumptions about, well, you probably don't want to do this or assumptions or passing remarks about other colleagues as well, which also tells like tells about the culture in, in the department and um, can be different. Yeah. So I think, yes, I have. Uh, but it's largely been related to, uh, like, uh, well, motherhood, et cetera. So, yeah, that's what, largely what I've experienced, yeah. Can you, if you are comfortable only, um, explore that a bit further? So in what ways, like, was it paternalistic? Was it inhibitive? Um, you know, how how did it really affect your ability to, to encounter opportunity or your ability to do your job? Um, so I think it was, so the example was, um, you know, uh, assumptions that, oh, you probably don't want to go travel and go to conferences because you have young kids. 
And when you're at conferences, then people saying, oh, well, who's taking care of the kids? And then so it's this, I'd say, prohibitory Mm -hmm. um, and sort of not making you feel welcomed at places where you want to go to and feel excited about going to. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes... Uh, then it becomes on top of that this uh, where you already feel you can already feel guilty about going and then despite what your partner or your family says Mm -hmm. and then hearing this that like oh well I didn't think you'd come or oh I didn't think you could attend or what are you doing here or who's Mm -hmm. taking care of the kids and then it um, sort of makes you feel unwelcomed or that maybe you shouldn't be going because what about my kids and all these things so like Mm -hmm. So that's the one part. Um, so that's been, uh, makes you sort of think about, well, that's, I've already thought about it for myself and I know my family best, but you're making assumptions about my family and what's best for me, mm-hmm. um, knowing nothing about me mm-hmm. and taking no, you know, no care in actually figuring out what's going on. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> And so that's the one thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so that would be the one example. Has it? it, Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Don't go ahead. Yep. No, no, no. I want to hear what you have to say. Well, and then I'd say, like, on the other side, there's been some positive interactions where, like, and that's where really um, having um, mentors or people who have gone through the same thing as you, where they do sort of tell you this is the, this is honestly the way it is. So like that whole concept of like balancing work and life will never really happen. There'll be days that work is predominant and there'll be days where you can take that time and and, and work will have to take a back seat and then you, you can balance your personal life, whatever that may be. So it doesn't necessarily mean family it can actually mean some self-care as well mm-hmm. or, you know, friends or other things in your life. Yeah. So yeah. and then also thinking about time as not like quantity, but quality and I think that can be that was really helpful in um, in the department. So there are definitely people who are mm-hmm. super helpful in the department. Yeah. And are there any through lines in within the culture of the department or the division um, that you know in that vein of like assumptions or um, ideas that get carried forward about people? Um, who are of a certain gender, who are of a certain, like, say they are parents or not parents, like, is there any sort of, um, like, culture there? Or do you think it's just individuals who um, spoke based on what they presumed your lived experience was? Uh, I think there's some assumptions be made if you, uh, like, about your own culture and then, also your goals I'm going to say if you look like other people in the department who are already gone through and think that that you will be that exact same person because you are of the same culture and there's right. some spin that is made about you know everybody oh everybody from that culture is exactly the same I see and yeah so <laughs> which can be challenging because you can feel like, oh, I am not like, oh, I'm not doing what is assumed of me. And I should be able to do those things because that that is the expectation mm-hmm. um, versus understanding that we've all lived very different li- experiences. And uh, and just because you are of the same like on paper, you know, mm-hmm. cultural background, everybody like let's just like everybody's lived experience despite their culture Mm -hmm. is uh is different and like we are not cookie cutter of each other yeah absolutely and I think like if I'm even going to think of my own bias like I don't know like growing up it was always like the you know the majority culture which is white it's all the same like it's just Mm -hmm. white but that's like also a bias like it's not all the same it is very like obviously it's so diverse Mm -hmm. even what lived experiences from from you know where from everybody's lived experiences Mm -hmm. so I think that inherent bias is in everybody when we're looking at a different culture that we don't we don't we've never lived in and like um 
So I, I can understand, I can appreciate where that's coming from, but it can be challenging to be um, um, when people are making assumptions about you because you're from a certain culture. Well, because the idea of being treat me as an individual, not a replication of the person who already exists. Um, yeah. is like just because I am the same gender, the same, um, you know, ethnic background as someone or I've trained with them doesn't mean that I will fulfill the exact same space within the division as them. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Because it's hard, right? You're like, well, yeah. do, you, do you care about me for me or do you care about me because I'm a co- like a copy paste of this other person in your eyes? Yeah. And you want to you want to like succession for that person. And that, like and then you're like, oh, maybe that would be OK. Maybe I can do those things. Or like, do I want to do those things? Mm-hmm. Like I'm and, and knowing like it's a kind of a oh, I don't want to use profanity, but it messes with your mind a little bit mm-hmm. like trying to understand who you are and what Mm -hmm. goals you have Mm -hmm. um like what is being driven by an internal motivation versus what is being driven because you keep being told this message over and over again yeah absolutely yeah that's hard that's so hard yeah and and yeah whether it's being done like purposely and i think there is a bit of succession planning that they like all departments want to think of Mm-hmm. um versus anyways um versus like are there just qualities there that are similar that you because you never knew what like that person was like in their training and like yeah. and that anyway so um whether there are some qualities there that make sense because they're about your qualities so I think that's uh yeah, anyways yeah. that's part of that yeah but I mean, different generations and different like viewpoints and different lived experiences as well. So for sure, and you're not going to see the same the, the world through the same lens as someone who came before you because the world is different. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. Um. So the very my, last, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, oh no, I was just gonna say like, huh, like my husband is Irish and he never met someone from South, like from my culture before until we like met in med school. And there was three Canadian girls who were of South Asian background and it was three of us. And, and he said to me once, he was like, I like, I can't believe how different all three of you are <laughs> like from your background, yeah. from your, the way you approach life, your like families, like you're different. Like he was just like, you guys are so different and like and like it's sort of recognizing like why would anybody assume that you guys would be the same yeah and I was like yeah <laughs> like yeah. hello hello like like one was like Indian, one was a smiley but he was just like yeah like why would people think that you guys are all the same you aren't <laughs> and I'm like yes exactly but it's like that sort of um yeah anyways I mean it is sort of that like funny through line when I was going through my training where it was just like, oh, like the gaggle of brown girls um, and yes, yes. Sort of getting mistaken for each other. And you're like, we are vastly different people. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. And that's like so amazing and like should be, again, so amazing that there was at least this diversity within like a similar background, like mm-hmm. may only similar by very little. Mm-hmm. Um, but but that that at least people could learn from that as well hopefully that they do learn that people are different Mm -hmm. um even though there's some you know different backgrounds yeah Yeah. for sure all right so the last question that i have is is there anything that we did not cover in this interview that you feel might be relevant to be said knowing that the purpose of this research is to explore how oncologists learn and understand the domains of edi um, I think there needs to be more training on UDI. I think there needs to be, inco- it needs to be incorporated early. Mm-hmm. Um, it needs to be like, if it wasn't incorporated in internal medicine, then, um, starting at PGY4 and really showing how it can, um, influence patient interactions, um, you know, their, whether they are able to get their treatment effectively, because 
and then able to get the benefit of their treatment and that, and then help them live lo- longer and better. And that's really the goal. But understanding that EDI plays a, can play a big part in certain patients' lives, like if they're vulnerable and, and it's a missing part of why, say, some patients may not do as well as we want them, we would hope for them to do. Mm-hmm. And that it could be something that we can work on as well. And how would you see that training incorporated, you know, reflecting on your residency, your fellowship, um, what would you have wished was included then? You know, even, a, <clears throat> even like, a, even at like a half, like even just starting in half days, even uh, like um, uh, a talk about, you know, different like and like um gender identity and then talking mm-hmm. about socioeconomic status like it, equity and how that can affect mm-hmm. um your patient and recognizing that working with social workers understanding what how they help and how they can and what is available for patients and like um how that and how you can use that support like help access that support so you can help your patients mm-hmm. and even just asking the question about social aspects of of a person's life Mm -hmm. um which doesn't get asked a lot (laughs) you're like I don't know anything about this patient like do they live at home alone do they Mm -hmm. have like um you know if they're elderly are they frail do they fall like those sort of like actual questions that are so important Mm -hmm. so really exposure is is what I'm hearing yeah and then and then, like, also, let's learn about our more vulnerable populations. Let's learn about those, those might, like, those populations that don't get, their voices aren't heard in the major, majority. And, like, those patients, and those people are still suffering from cancer and come to our cancer center or don't come to our cancer center because, again, they feel like, again, because they are, say, excluded from, from our system because of those barriers that we're not recognizing or mm-hmm. helping them. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, the more you see, the more you learn, um, and the more you normalize, the the more, um, I guess, muscle memory it can become. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Yeah. All right. And with that, we're going to wrap up. We're going to start with stopping all the recordings. Woo! The, <laughs> the joys of look at stopping, right? <laughs>